Dead America, Portland, Part 3. Dead America, The Third Week, Book 5. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 17. Man, I never thought I'd say this in a million years, but Mr. Hardaway was absolutely correct, Calvin said, swinging his lanky country boy arms as he walked along the interstate. Zion cocked a brow, looking down at the shorter man. Who in the hell is Mr. Hardaway? Oh, sorry, Calvin replied with a laugh. He was my high school gym teacher, really salty son of a bitch, who hated every kid he came into contact with. His dark-skinned friend shook his head. Sounds like the perfect choice to be a teacher. Fucking right, Calvin rolled his eyes. By the time my senior year rolled around, this jack wagon was on his third or fourth divorce. Since he didn't have the budget for counseling, he took his frustrations out on us. Zion put up a meaty hand. Now, in his defense, he was a public school teacher, he pointed out. It's not like he had the budget for a professional counselor. His shorter friend pursed his lips and thought for a moment before nodding in agreement. Yeah, that's a good point, he admitted. And what little money he did have, he used it on the booze. Every day during class, he'd point at one of us and yell, Go get my liquor, boy. It's in the office desk behind my revolver. He brought his hands to his chest, as if to tuck his thumbs into invisible suspender straps. And don't go touching my piece, you hear? Not a bad way to go, Zion replied with a chuckle. Especially if you've ever dealt with a woman. Damn, Calvin teased. You better not let Monique hear you say that. The taller man's chuckle turned into a full-blown laugh. Oh, she knows, he said. She may act all sweet, but there are a few broken men in her past. Well, maybe if I'm lucky, I can be one of the broken men in her future, Calvin replied wistfully. Zion shook his head, eyebrows raised. We really need to find you a hobby, brother. The country boy jerked his thumb over his shoulder, pointing to the mass of rotting flesh that was keeping a decent pace with them. You mean doing a cattle zombie drive every day doesn't count as a hobby? If it does, we're in some desperate times, Zion replied with a sigh. Calvin shrugged. I think we're there, man. They continued to walk in the sun, light glinting off of the area, almost as if there weren't a pack of zombies shuffling behind them. But circling back for a second, Zion spoke up. You never said what you thought your alcoholic gym teacher was right about. Calvin shook his head. Oh, yeah, sorry, got a little sidetracked there. Happens to the best of us, the taller man said. Well, every day he'd run us to death up and down the football field, rain or shine, Calvin began. He would always tell us that staying in top physical condition was the single most important thing we could do outside of getting him his liquor, of course. And now since we're doing daily marathon walks, I gotta admit, he was absolutely correct. Sounds like that was painful for you to admit there, bud, Zion teased. Calvin wiped his forehead with the back of his pasty hand. Shit, man, with as much pain as he inflicted on me that year, it would have taken the end of the world for me to admit he was right about anything, he admitted. You ever have any problems like that in school? I was six foot, 200 pounds, and a known gang enforcer when I was a sophomore, Zion said with a grin. If I didn't turn in my homework, my teacher would apologize to me. Calvin shook his head in bewilderment. Different worlds, man, different worlds. They continued up the road a bit farther before seeing the curve ahead. Just around the bend was their hiding spot, a long drainage tunnel that would provide them cover and lead them back to their truck. What do you say we pick up the pace? Zion asked, glancing over his shoulder at the zombie horde. Calvin nodded, and they took off running, making sure they were out of sight from the zombies around the corner before rushing off of the road. They threw open the metal gate at the tunnel and got inside, shutting it silently behind them. They stood in the musty water, listening for their followers. The footsteps and moans got louder and then the front edge of the zombie parade came into view on the roadway. 
Come on, Zion muttered under his breath. You know we're still out there. Just keep moving. Thankfully, the corpses didn't break stride, continuing up the interstate, leading their friends along with them. The men in the tunnel breathed a sigh of relief. Zion playfully patted his friend on the chest. What do you say there, bud? He asked. You ready to head back? Fuck yeah, man, Calvin replied, raising his palms above his head. The less time we spend in here, the better. As they started to walk, his friend raised an eyebrow. Don't tell me you're still scared of this place. Still have nightmares about that wall of zombies our first time through, Calvin admitted, wrinkling his nose. Well, that's why we're doing it this way from here on out, Zion assured him. We run the risk of losing some of the pack on the road, but if it keeps you from panicking, then it's worth it. Come on, man, I didn't panic, his shorter friend whined. Might have pissed myself a little, but I didn't panic. Zion laughed as they continued down the long path. As they passed all of the side tunnels, they reached out to make sure that the rigid metal fencing they'd installed was still secure and untouched. Calvin hesitated at each one, checking doubly sure to make sure there was nothing that could grab him through the bars. Oh, come on now, nothing is gonna get you, Zion said, as he noticed his partner was lagging behind. Even if they do reach out and grab you, they ain't gonna have enough time to pull you over and eat you. Yeah, you're right, Calvin admitted, though he didn't sound convinced. He still didn't pick up the pace, but Zion was okay to slow down. He gave his friends a hard time, but he knew that not everyone was as hardened as he was to the scary shit that could happen to them out here. He casually strolled beside his friend. So, what do you think? Think of what? Calvin asked, confused. How many of those suckers do you think we've pulled out of the city and sent on down the road? Zion asked, as a means of distraction. It worked, and the shorter man shook his head, trying to think. Oh, man. He pursed his lips for a moment. Easily in the thousands? Probably over 10,000. I think you're a little low on that estimation, Zion replied, rubbing the back of his neck. Wouldn't surprise me if we're over 20,000 by now. Not that I'm gonna stop and count. Calvin took a deep breath. Still got a long ways to go before we get this city clear, though. Gotta admit, we're off to a pretty damn good start, Zion pointed out. Not too bad for a brother from the hood and a pot-smoking country boy. His friend chuckled. You right about that, he agreed, and reached into his breast pocket for the little joint he'd stashed there. You are right about that. They continued their trek down the watery tunnel as Calvin puffed on his joint, significantly more relaxed as they checked the fencing all the while. When they finally emerged out the other side into the light, the shorter man took an extra deep breath, smiling at the sun. Man, you really don't like being down there, do you? Zion asked. Calvin shook his head, inhaling the last of his joint, and on the exhale, spoke rapidly. Nope. Don't know if it's the zombies, the smell, or the fact I got stuck when some of the neighborhood kids dared me to climb through a drainage pipe under the road when I was five, which I had no idea scarred me for life until I ventured down in there. He drew a deep breath as he ran out of air at the end of the sentence. Zion patted his friend on the shoulder. I'm gonna go with all three, he suggested. Yeah, that's a good call, Calvin agreed. Come on, let's get back to the complex. His friend waved him forward. Heard a rumor when we were heading out that someone was making up a fresh batch of biscuits to go with breakfast. Calvin immediately perked up and rushed over to the truck, clambering in like an eager child headed to the playground. Couldn't have said it better myself, country boy, Zion said to himself, and then got into the driver's seat. They headed back down the now vacant interstate towards home. Chapter Two The two drove towards the mid-rise apartment complex they've called home for the last few weeks in the apocalypse. As they headed up the road, still a few miles away, there were a few stray zombies just off of the side of the pavement. You want to call that in? Zion asked. Calvin nodded and pulled out a walkie-talkie, bringing it to his lips. 
Hey, Cheryl, you copy? Got you loud and clear. A female voice came back immediately. He leaned his elbow on the open window. We're coming up the road towards home, and we got a few stragglers a couple miles out. You want to dispatch some of the trainees? Sure, I'll get them sent that way, Cheryl replied. And when you boys get back, you come see me. Got some stuff to discuss. Calvin nodded. Appreciate it, thanks. See you in a few. He shoved the walkie-talkie back into his pocket. You checked in on the trainees lately? Zion asked as he rounded a bend. His passenger nodded. Yeah, a couple of them are getting pretty good delivering headshots with their spears. What about the other ones? Zion asked. Calvin grimaced, shaking his head. Pretty sure they'd have trouble hitting water if they fell out of a boat, he admitted. There's no way we can send them out on their own. Might have to pair them off and have them be the blockade, his friend suggested. Calvin's brow furrowed. Blockade? Yeah, they can keep some of them busy while the capable ones clear them out, Zion replied. Stab those things in the chest and hold them at bay until they can be dealt with. Used to have a couple of them in my crew back in the day. His passenger smirked. Only with less stabbing? Zion just chuckled. If you say so. Calvin shook his head in response as they pulled up to the parking garage door. They sat for a moment before the metal barrier began to rise and a guard popped out, waving for them to pull in and park. Man, I can't wait to get my hands on some of those fresh biscuits. The shorter man moaned in excitement. Zion shook his head. Sorry, bud, but you heard Cheryl, he said as he cut the engine. We got stuff to discuss. But, but, biscuits, Calvin whined. Unless you want to be eating those biscuits through a straw, Zion warned. Probably wouldn't be a good idea to make Cheryl wait. Calvin wrinkled his nose and then nodded. Well, let's get up there and get it over with. Maybe there will be some leftovers. They slammed their doors, waving to the door guard as they headed off towards the stairwell. Chapter Three Zion knocked on the door to Cheryl's office. You may enter, she said from inside. The duo headed in to see the blonde sitting behind a desk covered in all numbers of paper and maps, radios dotting the shelves behind her. Hey, Cheryl, Zion greeted as they approached. She stacked a few papers, studying one without looking up. About time you boys got back, she said as she flipped the sheet over. Mission successful? Oh yeah, Calvin replied with a grin. Got another thousand or two of those things let out of town. She kicked away from her desk, sending her rolling office chair gliding across the hardwood floor. She planted her foot in front of a whiteboard hanging on the wall and grabbed an eraser, removing the number 17.5K and replacing it with 19K. As her marker squeaked across the surface of the board, Calvin squinted. What you got there? he asked. She popped the lid back on the marker and set it on its shelf, spinning around to look at him. Figured we should start keeping track of how many of those things we get out of town. So we're up to 19,000? He straightened his shoulders. Looks like we're doing pretty good, huh? She laced her fingers in her lap. The pre-war population of the Portland metro area was 2.4 million, so I wouldn't be getting too excited just yet. Calvin looked at his dark-skinned companion, who just smiled sheepishly and shrugged. Look at it like this, he said. At least you're never gonna be bored. Cheryl sighed. Yeah, but a lot of people around here are, she pointed out. And that's going to be a major problem if we don't address it soon. What are you talking about? Calvin's brow furrowed. The able-bodied people like yourself are able to get out and remain active with a purpose she explained, brushing a stray lock of hair behind her ear. We have a lot of older and younger people here who don't have a whole lot to do other than stare at the walls. He crossed his arms. So they're safe inside the wall of a fortress? He scoffed. How is that bad? We're already seeing signs of people getting a little stir-crazy, Cheryl said, shaking her head. Not only is that bad for people's health, but it puts the community at whole at risk. 
All it would take is one person who can't take it anymore leaving through a side door and letting those creatures in by accident. And now with the added stress of several young children running around, it's something that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. Zion cocked his head. So what do you propose? Glad you asked, she replied with a smile and held up a finger as she rolled back over to her desk. She dug through a few papers and pulled out two specific ones, handing each man a crisp sheet. I asked around for things people would like, so you know what to look for. The duo looked over the lists, noting common items like books and sporting equipment, alcohol, of course. There were also a few more difficult items like video games and movies. Yeah, we can add a couple more stops to the list, Zion agreed as he scanned his sheet. We're hitting that string of mini malls on the north side after we get some breakfast. Pretty sure there's a bookstore up there. Cheryl shook her head. Going to have to put a pin in that one. You got something for us? Zion looked up from his paper. Calvin's eyes lit up. Find another batch of survivors? Several, actually, she replied, and shoved some papers aside to reveal a metro regional map of Portland. There were a few post-it notes stuck to the outer fringes on the south side, the opposite side from the complex. I picked up a couple of potentials overnight, she explained, and pointed to one of the notes. This one claims to have half a dozen survivors holed up in a small grocery store. Talk to them for a bit on the radio, and they seem legit. Zion leaned over. And the other one? Don't have direct confirmation, Cheryl said, shaking her head. One of the survivors at the grocery store says he used to be with a group that was in one of the mansions in the fancy neighborhood. Claims he got separated from the group when they were on a supply run and couldn't get back. Ended up shacking up with this group. Calvin pursed his lips. And you believe him? She held up her hand and wiggled it back and forth. Eh, maybe, she admitted. It's only a mile from the first site, so it's worth checking out. Sounds like an easy day. Zion replied. Yep, for the people from Wendy's camp who are checking it out, Cheryl said. The duo glanced at each other, and then back at her, confused. Well, where the hell are you sending us? Calvin asked, putting his hands on his hips. I don't see any more of those sticky notes on there. She smiled and dug through her papers for a moment, and then pulled out a larger map of the entire state of Oregon, which also included the southern part of Washington. She spread it out flat, and then pointed to a lone post-it note way outside the city to the east. Guessing you got a long-distance call? Zion asked, rubbing his forehead. Cheryl nodded. That I did, from a young woman in White Salmon, Washington. White Salmon? Zion raised an eyebrow. That's the shittiest white boy rapper name ever. While that is an undeniable fact, the other undeniable fact is that this girl and her friends could really use our help, Cheryl said. He nodded. What's the situation? Why don't you ask her yourself, she asked, and then kicked off of her desk again, rolling back to one of the radios. She picked up a receiver and clicked it on while waving the duo over. Hey, Tori, it's Cheryl. Are you there? After a brief moment, a young woman's voice came through the speaker. Hi, Cheryl, I'm here. She was a bit squeaky, but still filled with confidence. I'm gonna let you speak with Zion, the blonde said. He's the leader of our group, and the one who is going to be helping you out today. Oh, thank you so much, Tori gushed. Cheryl nodded. Sure thing, hang on a second. She handed the receiver to Zion, and he took a seat on a nearby stool at the table. Hi, Tori, he said slowly. What, um... What seems to be the problem down there? Well, the nickel version is that my friends and I are being harassed by some real assholes across the river, the young woman explained. It used to be just exchanging insults, but in the last few days it's gotten more intense. Zion frowned. How much more intense? Four dead with multiple injuries, came the reply. He took a deep breath, rubbing his forehead again. Yeah, I'd say that qualifies as more intense, he agreed. So what do you envision me doing exactly? Well, Cheryl said you were building up the city and connecting the survivor groups, Tori explained. 
I was kind of hoping you could come mediate. He barked a humorless laugh. Sounds like I'm a victim of my own success. So you're going to come help us? Hope exploded in the girl's excited voice. He nodded. Yeah, we'll come on down and have a chat with your neighbors to the south, he said. Gonna take us a little while to get there, though, since it looks like you're 20 miles on the far side of the middle of nowhere. No worries whatsoever, Tori gushed. We're hunkered down in the hardware store. It's about three blocks up from the bridge. Just cut through the woods and we'll be up on the right. Sion glanced at Cheryl to make sure that she was writing all of it down, which of course she was. Do you have a short range radio handy? He asked. Sure do, Tori replied. He nodded. We'll be on channel 22. We'll let you know when we're nearby. Thank you again so much, both of you, she gushed. You travel safe. Sit tight and we'll see you soon, Zion assured her, and then tossed the receiver on the table as the line went dead. Looks like we got a road trip. Calvin raised a hand. Can we at least get the breakfast to go? They already got a couple of plates set aside for you, packed up and ready to go, Cheryl replied. His eyes lit up like a kid at Christmas. It's almost like you knew we were going to take this job, Zion said, giving her a playful side eye. She smirked, almost like I knew what would happen if you didn't. While we're gone, maybe you can get some of the better trainees to go out with the zombie corralling group, he suggested. She nodded, already got them penciled in for when they get back from the cleanup duty to be called in. He held up his hands, palms out, as he got to his feet. What would I do without you? Pray that you never have to find out, Cheryl replied, and then shooed them towards the door. Now you boys get going, I got more work to get done. The duo exited and shut the door quietly behind them, the sound of shuffling papers clear as day. Never a dull moment, is it? Calvin asked brightly as they headed down the hallway. Zion laughed and shook his head. No, sir, it is not. Chapter Four Zion sat in the passenger seat of a newer model truck with Calvin behind the wheel. In a previous life, this truck had been the country boy's baby. Even in the apocalypse, he refused to let anyone drive it, even Zion. The interstate was a little cluttered, with the occasional crash and overturned vehicle on the road. Construction in the eastbound lane had it down to just one outside of town, which had been quickly stopped by a wreck on day zero, forcing would-be escapees to flee south towards California. Man, it is so nice to get out of town and let my girl stretch her legs, Calvin said with a grin. Zion stuck his arm out of his open window, letting it dance in the wind as they cruised at a good clip down the road. Just don't stretch them too much, he warned. If we get into a wreck, I don't think AAA is gonna come rescue us. Calvin grimaced and dropped the speed down to about 35 from 50 nodding to concede the valid point. Man, he finally said, can I ask you a question? Sure thing, Zion replied, leaning his head back against the headrest. What's on your mind? His friend took a deep breath. Back in your, you know, he struggled to find the words, wanting to say gang days, but at a glance from Zion knew that was a poor choice. Uh, youth. Did you ever get into a situation where you were just terrified? Nice save, his passenger commended. Calvin smiled sheepishly. Thanks. To answer your question, though, Zion continued. Of course, I've been scared before. The driver shook his head. No, not just scared, he said. I mean, terrified to the point where you didn't know if you were going to make it home that night. Zion shrugged, thought for a moment and then said, nah, never been terrified like that. Come on, really? Calvin asked, eyebrows hitting his hairline. You've never been in a situation where you thought this is the end? His passenger nodded, holding up a hand. Don't get me wrong, I've been in situations where it could have been the end of it all, he admitted. I just never got terrified over it. Well, do tell, Brother Zion. Share your secret with the congregation. Calvin exclaimed, raising a fist. Lord knows I could use some of that confidence. 
Zion pulled his arm in from the window and rested it on his leg. I just live in the mindset of when I go on dangerous jobs that I'm not coming back. Calvin opened his mouth and then closed it again, shocked. When he finally spoke, his voice was hoarse. That's not very comforting, especially since we're currently in a dangerous job. It's really the only way to stay calm in tight situations, Zion explained. If your mind is distracted by thinking about your girl waiting on you in a comfy bed with a cold beer and a Costco-sized pallet of condoms, then your enemy already has an advantage over you. When I go into a situation not expecting to survive it, it's a whole lot easier to focus on the moment. Calvin shook his head, letting out a deep breath between his teeth. Man, that is some next-level head game shit right there. I'm telling you, brother, it works, Zion insisted. I got into this one situation just before I walked away from it all. Some wannabe gangster thought he was just gonna waltz right into our turf and set up shop. Well, the people I worked for didn't take too kindly to that, so they sent me over with a not-so-welcome basket. Calvin put up a hand. Wait, 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 he said. What is in a not-so-welcome basket? Oh, you know, the standard, his friend replied casually. Some fruit, nuts, and assorted cans of whoop-ass. The driver chuckled. Guess that's not a big holiday seller, he quipped, and then cocked his head. Although I could see it in some families. No kidding, Zion agreed. Calvin glanced at him. So what happened? It was in this shitty little garage in a neighborhood you would have lasted about six seconds in before getting robbed, his friend explained, eyes near glazing over with the memory. I go in through the side door with two of my boys for backup. It's just him and one other dude sitting on the couch playing video games. I knew something was up when he didn't shit himself as soon as I walked in. So I go into my talk, which had proved very effective in the past, but this brother didn't even look away from the screen. After a few moments, I trail off, which is when he pauses the game and gets up. He gets nose to nose with me, or nose to chest, since he was about five foot four, acting all smug. I let him ramble on for a few seconds before reaching up and grabbing him around the neck. Before I could snap it, I had two guns to the back of my head. Oh shit, Calvin exclaimed, smacking the steering wheel in his shock. The boys you brought with you? Zion nodded. Yep, he said. Turns out they were his cousins, and he had recruited them to come work for him instead. So how did you get out of it? Calvin prompted. His friend smiled. By being calm. Calm? Calm? Calvin cried. What did you do, talk your way out of it? Zion laughed. Oh, hell no, he replied, slapping his thigh. I beat everyone in that room to within an inch of their life with a tire iron. Took a couple of rounds while doing so, but remained nice and calm as I gave each of them permanent injuries to remember me by. That's insane, man, the driver gushed, shaking his head in bewilderment. I'm guessing that wannabe gangster got the message. Sion shrugged. Never saw him or those other boys again, he confirmed. Don't know what happened to them. All I remember is passing out once I got back to the clubhouse. Woke up a couple days later, all patched up. My boss came in and said, good job. Left a stack of hundreds on the table and walked back out. I'm guessing your boss was the type of man you didn't question? Calvin wrinkled his nose. Zion shook his head, sticking his arm back out the window and drumming on the outside of the door. Not unless you wanted your family and friends to wonder what happened to you. Man. Calvin trailed off in awe. That's a hell of a story, bro. I don't have anything that can rival that. Closest I got is when my buddy and I got into a feud with a family of badgers and all of a sudden, the driver's side window shattered. The jolt caused Calvin to swerve to the left, grinding it up against the metal median barrier of the highway. What the fuck? He cried. Zion scanned the hills to the right, noting several glints of scopes reflecting in the sun. We got company, he said firmly. Step on it. Calvin hit the gas, still swerving a little as bullets peppered the truck. They're hurting my baby, he screeched. His passenger stared out, surveying the landscape, 
and then saw a metallic object fly through the air up ahead, smoke rising up behind it. Pipe bomb, he yelled. Hard left. Calvin jerked the wheel, the truck just barely passing the bomb as it went off. The back windshield exploded, the bed denting from behind. More shots ricocheted off of the vehicle, and he steered towards an embankment that went to the westbound lane towards the river. Hang on, this is gonna suck, he yelled. Zion grabbed the handle above his head, holding on tight as the truck jumped down the road shoulder and bounced down the embankment. When they hit pavement again, Calvin tried to hit the brakes, but they were moving too fast. The truck skidded across the westbound lane and continued down the next embankment towards the river. I can't stop, Calvin cried. They braced for impact as the truck splashed into the water, about eight feet away from the bank. The water wasn't too deep, only coming up to the top of the front bumper. Bullets rained down on them, hitting the car and the water, splashing everywhere. Get to the front, Zion barked, and they shoved their doors open. He moved quickly, getting around the front bumper for cover. Calvin leaned into the back seat to grab his sniper rifle and joined his friend, narrowly missing a bullet that pinged off of the side of the door as he slipped by. Holy hell, man, you good? Zion huffed as his friend joined him. Calvin nodded. Just trying to stay calm, he said. That's my boy. Zion clapped him on the shoulder. His friend took a deep, ragged breath. So now what, he asked. Zion looked around, seeing no cover towards land. But then behind him, there was a tiny strip about 50 yards away on the water. There were a few canoes peeking through the trees. We're going for a swim, he said, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Calvin glanced behind them and groaned. As much as I'd love to make these fuckers pay for baby here, it's gonna have to wait, huh? They dove into the water, submerging completely to help protect from the bullets still flying their way. Shots smacked into the water the whole way over, barely missing them even with their cover. As they got to the dingy old dock, Zion pulled himself up first and then helped his friend up. As soon as Calvin hit the wood, he took a knee and turned back towards the truck, looking through his scope. You get the boat, I'll cover us, he said, watching a few guys with rifles skidding down the embankment. Zion nodded and immediately got to work untying a canoe and securing the paddles. Calvin took careful aim, squeezing the trigger and punching a giant hole in one man's chest. His buddies panicked, diving behind the waterlogged truck for cover. He continued to aim downrange, just waiting for someone to pop their heads up so he could blow it up like a pinata. Come on, we're out, Zion said, hopping into the boat. Calvin backed up and jumped in, reaching for a paddle. No, you keep covering us, his friend said, shaking his head. I'll get us across the water. The sniper nodded and narrowed his eyes, falling into sentry mode. He scanned the shoreline, keeping his senses alert, as Zion moved them towards the other bank. Calm, man, calm. Chapter 5 Zion rowed the boat up to the bank on the Washington side of the river, and they quickly jumped out into the grass. Calvin helped him pull the boat behind some bushes, jumping down into the brush as they heard engines in the distance. Those motherfuckers are gonna pay for hurting my baby, Calvin growled. Zion nodded. Damn right they are. The sniper checked his ammo, pulling out the magazine from the gun, before getting frustrated and slamming it back into the rifle. How many shots you got? Zion asked. Calvin grunted. Seven, he replied. The rest of the ammo is still in the truck. Same here with everything I brought, his friend said. Looks like we're gonna have to go old school brute force on this one. The sniper nodded. As long as I get to kneecap the bastards that did this. You don't wanna kill them? Zion asked, surprised. Fuck no, Calvin spat. They deserve to limp the rest of their days, as they know why they're limping. Zion cracked a smile, impressed by his partner's newfound rage. That's my boy. The engines grew louder, and they stayed low in the bushes. They looked towards the bridge over the river, 
and saw half a dozen vehicles rumbling across. Looks like they're sending a welcome party, Calvin muttered. Zion smacked his shoulder. Come on, he urged. Let's get to the hardware store. They pushed their way through the thick brush. As they moved through the woods, a clearing came up ahead, leading to the edge of town. Zion stopped suddenly, putting his hand on his partner's chest to get him to stop. He held a finger to his lips, and they both listened to the sound of shuffling feet just up ahead. He motioned for Calvin to stay put, and then silently crept forward. After several steps, a rail-thin female zombie stumbled out from around a tree. It growled and reached out through holes in its tattered hoodie and staggered towards him. Zion cracked a smile and then lunged forward, shoving the frail creature to the ground. As it landed hard on its back, he grabbed its feet and swung hard, sending the zombie into a thick trunk nearby, crushing its head. He turned back to Calvin, who gave him an enthusiastic thumbs up. They took pace together again and got to the edge of the clearing, taking a knee to survey the area. There was a row of houses leading to the street, and they could see straight up a few blocks into the main area of town. Engines continued to rumble in the distance. All right, here's what we're doing, Zion said quietly. Get across that backyard, use the house for cover to check for cars, then we haul ass straight up towards the hardware store. Calvin took a deep breath. Hopefully it's on this side street. If not, hang a right, Zion replied. His partner cocked his head. Why to the right? Dunno, Zion admitted with a shrug. Got instinct? Calvin sighed. Shit, man, good enough for me. Come on, let's move, Zion said, and they took off like a shot from the trees. They sprinted across the yard, taking up position next to the house. Zion poked his head out to look down the street, seeing no cars but a handful of zombies farther down. We're good, he said. He darted out with his partner hot on his heels, and they moved with a quick pace, the target two blocks away. When they got to the intersection, they checked both directions, just as an SUV turned towards them three blocks down. Shit, they spotted us, Calvin cried, as the vehicle gunned it in their direction. He fumbled with his gun as the engine screamed towards them, but Zion grabbed his shirt. Fuck it, just run, he cried, and they took off. Calvin threw his gun over his shoulder as they sprinted, making it halfway up the block as the SUV skidded around the corner towards them. He peeked over his shoulder and saw a figure leaning out of the passenger window, lighting a fire under his ass. They hit the next intersection and hung a right around the corner. This has got to be it, Zion huffed at the sight of a few dozen bodies laying in the middle of the road. They pushed on and tore towards the hardware store. The SUV skidded around the corner and fired a few shots from a handgun, narrowly missing them as they ran. Get down, a female screamed as they neared the store, and the duo dove to the ground as a loud thonk sounded. A four-foot-long wooden stake flew over their heads and punched through the windshield of the oncoming vehicle, and it skidded to a stop and began to back up quickly, the gunman ducking back inside. The duo rolled over and watched as the SUV ducked back around the corner. They looked at each other and let out a deep sigh of relief. So you guys want to come inside, or are you comfortable on the pavement? The woman asked. They looked up at her as they pulled themselves off of the ground. She was average height, with a thick, athletic build, shoulder-length sandy blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail. She stood in front of the door and pushed a set of thick-rimmed glasses up her nose. I could go inside. What about you? Calvin asked casually. Zion nodded. Same. They headed to the woman, and he extended his hand. I'm Zion. This is Calvin. Tori, she replied, shaking their hands in turn. Thank you both for coming up. As you can tell, we could use the help. The sniper shook his head, motioning to the dead bodies in the street. Looks like you can handle yourself pretty well. Against the dead, for sure, she agreed. Against the living and their arsenal of guns and explosives, not so much. 
Calvin nodded his understanding. Yeah, I can buy that. Come on inside, Tori said, waving for them to follow her. Let me introduce you to the rest of the group. Chapter 6 Tori led them into the hardware store, which was missing its entire front window. They'd replaced it with chest-high chain-link fencing, with a wooden platform up above it. There was a giant metal monstrosity on the platform that looked like it had been assembled from a broken-down car and stuff from the plumbing aisle. It looked like a harpoon gun that would be more at home on a fishing vessel. A young Asian man stood behind it, no more than 19 or 20 years old. He shoved another long wooden stake into the gun before pressing a primer button on the side, a long tube running to an air compressor on the floor. You must be the vampire sniper, Zion said with a grin. The man raised an eyebrow. Vampire sniper? Yeah, with the wooden stake and all, Zion replied, motioning to the assembly. Dracula wouldn't stand a chance with you. The man laughed. Oh, I got it. Nice. This is Harold, Tori said, motioning to him. He's our resident engineer. Thanks for your help out there, Zion said. Harold gave him a little salute. My pleasure. Come on to the back here, Tori said. We've got some water if you'd like. She led them to the back of the store, passing by ransacked shelves, several shoved to the side, to create a massive workspace with tools and projects in various stages of development lying about. She was a few steps ahead, giving Zion and Calvin an opportunity to talk softly between themselves. Looks like they've been busy, the sniper murmured. Zion nodded in agreement. Like fucking MacGyver up in here. Tori opened the door to the back room, which looked like it had been a break room once upon a time. There were two people sitting on a couch, playing a two-player fighting game on a small TV. The girl was a petite Asian thing, easily no older than Harold. The other was a tall and athletic, all-American-looking guy, seemingly out of place with this group appearance-wise. Yeah, that's right, you're my bitch, the girl bellowed, furiously pounding buttons on her controller. The guy grunted. You haven't beaten me yet. The trio stood and watched the end of their round, the girl delivering a flying, spinning kick to the other character's face, resulting in a KO. Zion and Calvin blinked at them, surprised to see electricity back there. I'm gonna get you one of these days, the guy said, dropping his controller with a huff. The girl grinned. Don't count on it. Tori cleared her throat. Jack, Missy, I'd like you to meet some new friends, she said. This is Zion and Calvin. Hi. Missy said, waving. Jack nodded in their direction. hey -o. If you don't mind me asking, how in the hell are you playing video games? Zion blurted. Jack pointed to the corner, where there was a Frankenstein creation of several batteries wired together and connected to various other electrical components, all leading to the TV. Nothing major, he said offhandedly. Just a simple wiring job to a few around-the-store components, the TV and game system don't actually draw a whole lot of power, so it's not that hard. Zion raised an eyebrow, surprised that it had been the pretty boy giving the answer. Yeah, I know that look, Jack said, rolling his eyes. Caught, Zion pressed his lips together, rubbing the back of his head. Yeah, sorry, man, it's just... It's all good, Jack assured him with a thousand-watt smile. I know I don't look like the typical geek, yet here I am. More power to you, brother, Zion assured him. Tori headed over to a mini fridge and pulled out a few bottles of cold water, handing them to the parched duo. They cracked them open, savoring the icy cold. Thank you, Calvin moaned after taking a deep gulp. Been a while since I've had a cold one. She nodded. Well, we have plenty, so help yourself. So lay it out for me, Zion said leaning back against the counter. How did you get here, and who do I need to smack down to get them to leave you alone? She pushed her glasses up on her nose and crossed her arms. We were part of a group from Portland State who came out here to camp just before all this began, she explained. 
We actually spent several days hiding out in the woods after hearing about the unrest on the radio. Most of the group decided to try and make it back to campus, but the four of us didn't feel safe trying to make it back to Portland, so we came here as it was the closest town. Didn't take long for us to realize the radio wasn't exaggerating the situation. By sheer luck, we made it here and were able to set up defenses, which got us through the runner phase. But then we were running low on food, so we had to start venturing out, which is when we ran into our neighbors to the south. Zion ran his tongue over his teeth. Based on the reception we got, I'm guessing they aren't the friendliest bunch. That's an understatement, she agreed bitterly. The first few encounters were innocent enough. Ran into them at the grocery store and drugstore, exchanging a few playful barbs as we gathered supplies. Didn't take long for it to escalate, especially once the goods started running low. Calvin raised a hand. Guessing that's where the death came in. Yep, they thought since we were geeky college kids that they could just come into our new home and take whatever they wanted, Tori confirmed and raised her chin. They were mistaken. Zion took a swig of water. Nothing like having the element of surprise. Especially when combined with four chemistry and engineering students on PhD tracks, she replied with a grin. Calvin motioned to the door. So you fended them off with your anti-vampire gun? And a couple of explosives, Tori added. And maybe an acid bomb or two. Zion raised an eyebrow. Acid bomb? Yeah. She ran a hand over her ponytail, avoiding his gaze. Let's just say some of them aren't pretty anymore. The duo glanced at each other. I don't know about you, Calvin said to his partner, but I'm glad we're on their side. I know, right? Zion agreed. I'm too young to be letting my looks go. Tori smirked at him. We have some visitors, Harold called from the front, and the trio rushed back out through the store just as he was lining up his shot. Tori sighed with relief as they reached the fence. Dude, you really need to say dead visitors, she said firmly. You scared the hell out of me. Sorry, he replied, hanging his head. I just thought our new friends would want to see our defenses in action. He glanced at them. Zion smiled and nodded. Have at it, sir. Harold aimed the weapon at a zombie in the middle of the road and then pulled the lever on the gun sending a wooden stake flying across the street. The bolt hit the corpse squarely in the forehead, ripping the head clean off and embedding it into a wooden wall on the opposite side. Ah, oh, damn, boy, Zion breathed. That's a quality takedown. Calvin grinned. We could use one of these back home. If you get me the parts, Harold replied, I can build you as many of these as you'd like. Zion nodded, rubbing his chin. I think that can be arranged. Harold nodded and loaded up another stake before taking aim and firing. This one was a direct hit, but the creature was a bit meatier, so its head remained attached as it flew back onto the pavement, legs kicking up. The shooter stuck his head out and looked both ways. I think we're clear, he said, and hopped down from his post, heading to the door. He inspected the street carefully before heading out to collect the stakes from his victims. Zion and Calvin stepped onto the sidewalk to make sure he didn't run into any trouble on the way. So, Tori, any idea who we need to track down for a chat? Zion asked as he kept watch on the area. She shook her head. None of us have ever met him, but apparently his name is Edward. Edward, huh? Zion mused. Sounds like a bitch-ass name to me. Calvin shrugged. Yeah, sounds like it should be easy enough to convince him to leave you alone. I sincerely hope so, Tori replied, clasping her hands together in front of her. Before we head out to have a chat with this Edward, I have three questions for you, Zion said, turning towards her. And I want you to think hard about them before answering, because they are very, very important. She blinked at him, suddenly looking nervous. I can do that. One. He held up a finger. Do you trust me? Tori nodded immediately. Yes, of course. You came all this way after talking with me for two minutes, she pointed out. That makes you good in my book. 
okay? He continued and lifted a second finger. Two, will you abide by whatever deal I can make with Edward? Even if it means giving him some of your stuff or having to leave this town altogether? She hesitated, chewing her lip. Keep in mind, Zion added, I'm not gonna leave you homeless. If you do have to leave, I have a place for you. She pressed her lips into a thin line and nodded. We'll do whatever you need us to do. All right, now time for the third and final question. Zion continued, holding up both of his palms. It's the most important of all. Tori pushed her glasses up her nose, staring at him expectantly. Can you help me out in the weapon department? He asked. Mine kind of got lost in the river. She relaxed, face breaking into a huge smile. Let's go shopping. Chapter 7 Tori pranced into the store, ponytail bouncing as she went. The duo chuckled at her excitement as they followed her in. Missy, Jack, we got work to do, she called, and the two students appeared out of the break room. What's up? Jack asked, running a hand through his perfect hair. Tori motioned to Zion and Calvin. Our friends here need some weapons, she said. We don't have much in the way of guns, Missy replied, tapping her chin. How do you feel about blunt objects? Zion grinned. You are speaking my language. Will you go grab a two by four and I'll get the Dremel fired up? Missy replied. He saluted her. Yes, ma'am. He headed off with the petite girl, and Jack cocked his head at Calvin. So what about you, cowboy? He asked. Compared to your friend there, it looks like you have the upper body strength of a seventh grader, so I'm assuming blunt objects are out. Calvin scoffed playfully, holding up a hand in feigned offense. Hey now, he said. It's more like the upper body strength of a 10th grader. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm gonna need something that'll do its own damage. Jack contemplated for a moment and then snapped his fingers, eyes lighting up. Got it, he exclaimed. How about a couple of cordless power drills? Do we have enough time for them to charge up? Calvin asked, not hopeful. Jack nodded. Pretty sure there are some fast chargers on aisle eight, he replied. By the time Missy gets done, you should be good to go. Let's do it then, the cowboy agreed. I'll get him charging if you want to hit aisle seven and pick you out a couple of holsters, Jack suggested. Calvin chuckled, shaking his head. Looks like I'm gonna be a hardware cowboy, he said. This day might turn out good yet. While you get squared away, I'll pull what little info we have on the other side, Tori said. Calvin nodded and headed off with Jack as she disappeared into the back room to prepare for battle. Some time later, Jack and Calvin converged with Harold and Tori in the front of the store. Calvin proudly wore one black and one pink holster, each one loaded down with several dozen long drill bits. Jack handed him two drills, and the cowboy pretended to fire them before slipping them into the holsters. Yeah, these are gonna work just fine, he said with a grin. I went ahead and attached a quick release system for the bit, Jack explained. That way you can plant one of those things into a skull and pop it out quick without worrying about getting stuck. It's magnet-based, so all you have to do is yank back hard. Calvin nodded. Appreciate it, he replied. Trying to get a drill bit free from a zombie skull while his friends are bearing down on me isn't something that's on my bucket list. With good reason, Jack agreed. Zion approached from the back. You ready to do this? He hefted his weapon over his shoulder, which was a spiked two by four, with a handle carved into the base of it so he could use it as a bat. Silver duct tape adorned the handle to prevent splinters. Missy stepped up behind him, watching as he held out his new piece for the others to see. What do you think? Zion asked. Several cut pieces of rebar stuck out from the top eight inches or so of the weapon, and the group all gaped at the beastly thing. You look like you could do some damage with that, Tori said. Calvin scratched the back of his head. But why flat edges on the rebar instead of spikes? I felt like it would be bad if it got stuck in a zombie's head. Missy piped up. 
Besides, the force from his blow focused on these small points will be more than enough to cause a killing blow level of trauma. The cowboy nodded. Makes sense to me. Zion appraised his partner's weapons with eyebrows raised. Pink, huh? He asked. That's a cute look on you. Hey, Calvin replied, crossing his arms in a huff. It was the only left-handed holster they had in stock. Hey now, no need to get defensive, Zion replied, raising his hands, palms out. I was just trying to pay you a compliment. A laugh scattered through the group until Calvin finally rolled his eyes. Okay, moving on, he said. Where are we going? Tori pulled a drawing of the area from her pocket, spreading it out for them. We haven't been able to get much information about them, but as best as we can tell, there has been a lot of activity around this hotel. She pointed to a building just west of the bridge, overlooking a little inlet from the river. So we just waltz across the bridge, hang a right, knock on the door, and ask for Edward, Calvin quipped. Sounds like an easy day to me. Tori pushed her glasses up her nose. If only, she shook her head. I would assume that because of all the excitement today, that they're going to be watching that bridge pretty closely, so you're going to have to find another way across. We commandeer to boat, so we're good there, Zion piped up. Good, she replied, pointing at him. Going up the inlet is probably too risky, since you'll be in clear view of the bridge on the approach. If you go a little further west, there is a beach you can land at. Looks to be only half a mile or so up to the hotel. That sounds good to me, Calvin replied. Sion nodded. Same here, he added. I'd much rather do an assault on foot than trying to land a boat and immediately go at it. His partner drew one of his drills, giving it a quick couple of squeezes of the trigger to accentuate his words with a buzz. And it'll give us a chance to try out our new toys. Yes, it will, Zion added with a grin stroking the handle of his weapon. So what can we do in the meantime? Tori asked. He glanced at her. Just hang tight. And be on the lookout for us, Calvin added. Just in case our negotiations go as well as our first interaction with these jack wagons. She nodded firmly. We'll be ready. Chapter 8 Zion and Calvin headed down the street back towards the way they'd come towards the boat. They hung a left onto the side street and walked in the middle of the road, making sure they didn't get caught off guard. As they approached the first intersection, there were a few zombies just off to the left. Shall we? Zion held up his weapon. Calvin grinned. We shall. Zion stepped up first to a large male corpse, maybe six feet tall and well-built, wearing tattered hunting clothes. He swung, the top of the rebar catching the creature right in the temple and dropping it, the force of the blow sending the body skidding across the pavement. Oh yeah, he drawled. That'll work just fine. Calvin stepped up to the remaining two zombies, two teenagers who looked like they'd been playing football in the park. The blood on their knees offered a nice contrast to the grass stains as they turned towards him. He pulled out both drills and rammed them forward, while pulling the triggers. The tops bored through their respective skulls like butter, the zombies convulsing for a moment before falling backwards, taking the tips with them. That's gonna work too, Calvin declared. The duo smiled as they headed towards the woods, and the hardware cowboy inserted new bits as they walked before holstering his weapons. The path was clear, however they paused at the tree line before heading in. Why don't you follow me through here, Calvin asked. Not much room to be swinging that big hunk of wood. Zion grinned, showing teeth. Lucky for you, I've spent my whole life swinging a big hunk of wood around. Calvin hung his head, shaking it from side to side. I walked into that one, didn't I? He groaned. Damn right you did, Zion replied with a chuckle. Come on. They headed cautiously into the woods. There was a little bit of creaking, and they both stopped short to listen. After a moment, they looked up to see it was just the wind blowing the tops of the trees. Good thing I wasn't jumpy before all this bullshit started, 
Calvin said quietly. I'd hate to see what kind of catatonic mess I'd be in after all this. Zion nodded. No shit, he agreed. I know some boys back home who, if they're still alive, have probably spent the better part of the last month in the fetal position underneath their beds. I can safely say that's never been me, Calvin admitted. Even after that tunnel encounter. I mean, I haven't been able to fit under my bed since I was a kid. Zion cracked a smile at the self-deprecating joke as they continued through the woods. As they reached the water where their boat still hid beneath the brush, they did a quick scan, making sure nobody was spying on them. Calvin swept the area with his rifle scope. I think we're as good as we're gonna get, he reported. Did you see the beach Tori was talking about? Zion asked. His partner swung his gun to the west end of the opposite shoreline. Yep, he said. Looks like it's just slightly to the east of where we picked the boat up. All right, Zion replied. Let's get this thing to the water. I'll get us across while you keep an eye out for trouble. Calvin nodded, and they picked up the boat, moving it to the river. He hopped in, and his friend pushed it completely into the water before hopping inside to grab the oar, beginning to paddle across the river into a battle they had no idea of the outcome. Chapter 9 As they glided across the water, Calvin sat at the front of the canoe, aiming his rifle across the river. He did continual sweeps to make sure that nobody was hanging around, about to get the drop on them. Zion rode hard, creating some serious momentum as they approached the shoreline. The front edge of the boat ground against the sand just below the waterline, lurching to a stop. As soon as it did, Calvin hopped out and crept forward on land, continuing his sweep. Zion jumped out behind him, dragging the boat up onto the shore. How we looking? he asked. We're clear, his partner replied. Although I wouldn't suggest we stand out in the open like this much longer. Zion nodded. Agreed, let's move. Just leaving the boat here? Calvin asked, motioning to the canoe as he rested his gun on his shoulder. His partner nodded again. We might need an escape route. Fair enough, Calvin agreed. Lead on. They trotted off of the beach into the neighboring park area, finally taking shelter in a brick grilling area with a high wall. They knelt down out of sight and leaned together. Pretty sure the hotel is half a mile or so to the southeast. Zion said, and they peeked up over the wall slowly. There was a strip mall on the other side of the park, and he pointed at it, prompting Calvin to raise his rifle and peer through the scope. I don't see any movement outside of it, which isn't surprising, he murmured. If they are staying at a nearby hotel, there's a good chance they've cleared the area out. Wait. He refocused, noting two guards walking around the far corner of the building. They sauntered all the way across the front and then turned the corner on the far side to go around. Looks like we have some guards to contend with. Zion frowned. How many? Just two on that pass, Calvin replied. His partner pursed his lips. Let's hang tight here for a minute and see if they come back around, he suggested. If they do, it means they're patrolling the area. Probably keeping an eye out for us, Calvin muttered. Zion nodded. Let's hope so. His partner turned away from the scope to stare incredulously at him. Let's hope so? Yep, Zion replied. Because of their doing that, it means a lot of others are doing the same, so they're probably nice and spread out. Calvin thought it over for a moment and then nodded in agreement as a light bulb went off in his head. He peered back through the scope watching for the men as he scanned the building. He noticed that one of the restaurants had a walk-up window, and it was open. If they do come around again, he said, I have an idea. Zion raised an eyebrow. If that ain't the most dangerous thing I've heard all week. You know it, Calvin replied with a chuckle. He held up his gun so that his partner could look through, aiming it at the restaurant window. A smile erupted on Zion's face. We can get in and hit them before they know we're there. My thoughts exactly, Calvin agreed. 
Sion sat back on his haunches. Now we just gotta hope they're making rounds. They sat for several minutes, waiting and hoping the guards would show back up on the beginning side. After a few minutes, their patience was rewarded. We got some live ones, Calvin said. Zion rose into a squat. As soon as they're around the corner, we move. The sniper watched them carefully as they moved around, and as soon as they were around the corner, he slung the gun over his shoulder and followed Zion vaulting over the wall. They took off running across the park, as fast as their legs could carry them. Within moments, they were at the restaurant window. Calvin didn't hesitate, diving straight inside, landing with a thud on the floor after misjudging the length of the counter. He picked himself up quickly, drawing his drills just in case there was company inside. But after a fast sweep, he found he was alone. You good? Zion whispered as he slid across the counter. Calvin holstered his drills and gave him a half-hearted thumbs up. They crept over to the main set of doors, and Zion unlatched the lock, giving them a little wiggle to make sure they worked okay. He was pleasantly surprised that they swung both ways. When they come by, let them pass, he said quietly. We duck out, grab them, bring them in here, and knock them the fuck out. Once they're secure, we can politely ask them where Edward is. Calvin chuckled. I like how you emphasized politely there. Zion grinned viciously, his eyes betraying his excitement for delivering some retribution for the day these assholes had put them through. The duo hunkered down, laying in wait for their prey to wander past the doors. At the sound of footsteps coming up the sidewalk, they readied themselves. There was some idle chatter, and it grew louder and louder and Zion nodded to Calvin that it was almost go time. They remained out of sight as the guards strolled right past the door, not giving it a second look. As soon as they were clear, the hidden duo leapt through the swinging doors to catch their prize. Zion grabbed the closest one by the back of his shirt collar and whipped him back through the double doors. He crashed through them and skittered across the floor, stunned. Calvin tackled the second guy, who was just turning in surprise and took fistfuls of his shirt, swinging him around and using the momentum to throw him back with his friend. Zion moved swiftly, leaping on top of his fallen guard before he could get off of the floor. He brought his forehead down onto the bridge of the guy's nose, shattering it in his face and knocking him completely unconscious. Calvin managed to punch his opponent, but the guy was a lot bigger than him, and all it seemed to do was piss him off. The guard reared back and punched at the shorter man, but the cowboy was fast and ducked to the side, the blow glancing off of his shoulder. Calvin dove for him, but the guy kicked out, sending the country boy tumbling back over a table. Zion was on him in a flash, catching the guard beneath the chin and choke slamming him into the ground. His skull hit the floor with a crack, not knocking him unconscious, but causing him to writhe in pain as the ex-gang member held him down by the throat. You good, buddy? Zion asked Calvin, as casually as if he were discussing the weather. His partner got to his feet, brushing himself off and leaning against the table with a wince. I am not a fan of this fucking day at all, he declared. Well, it's about to get a little better, Zion replied with a grin. You lock up the doors and I'll prep our new friends here for a little talk. Calvin saluted him and hobbled over to the doors. With pleasure. Zion got to his feet, staring down at his grunting prey. He cracked his knuckles and grinned with maniacal glee. Okay, boys, hope you're feeling chatty. Chapter 10 With the guards tied tightly to two chairs, sitting in front of the table, Zion and Calvin stood across from them, gazing down at their handiwork. The guard with the bloody nose was conscious, but seemed woozy from the vicious headbutt. The larger guard was more alert, but still hissing in pain. Zion snapped his fingers. Hey, you with me there, bud? He asked. Go fuck yourself, monkey boy, the bigger guard rasped. Zion looked at Calvin, 
motioning to their prisoner as if to say, did this motherfucker just say that? He crossed his arms. Looks like we have ourselves a bold one. Let's see how bold he is after we talk to him for a minute, Calvin said. I ain't telling you boys shit, the guard hissed, sneering at them. So why don't you go over to the corner, jerk each other off, and then get the fuck out of town? Zion sighed, holding his hands out, palms up. Well, we were gonna be polite and ask you for directions to your boss, Edward, but I'm guessing you're not gonna be open to some friendly dialogue. Why don't you go get your mom and I'll be friendly to her? The guard spat and then laughed. Zion turned to his partner, shaking his head in bewilderment. Man, what is it about you white people and your extreme overconfidence? Fuck if I know, Calvin admitted, shaking his head. If I were in his position, I'd be pissing myself right now. Zion cocked his head. Well, you got any ideas? Calvin stared at the smug prisoner, and a sly smile curled his lips. Yeah, I do, he said. Get behind him and follow my lead. Zion shrugged, intrigued, and circled around the table to stand behind the guy. Calvin leaned forward, planting his hands flat on the table, staring eye to eye with the guard. So I'm going to try this the polite way first, the cowboy drawled. Where is Edward? The guard laughed. Probably back at your house fucking your mom. I'm a big believer in second chances, Calvin said, holding up a hand to Zion. So hold on a second. He cocked his head. Once again, I'll be polite. Where is Ed? The guard spat a massive loogie into the cowboy's face. Calvin stayed stock still, the viscous liquid dripping down his cheek and glopping onto the table. He waited a second and then reached up to wipe the residue from his face. Are you a religious man? Calvin asked calmly. The guard threw his head back and laughed again. Why, do you want to preach to me? Calvin glanced at his partner and pointed to the guy's arm as the guard continued to cackle and shake his head. Nope, the cowboy replied. Just wanted to see if you would enjoy emulating your hero if you were. The guard sneered, trying to mask his confusion, and then Zion released the restraint on his wrist, pinning his arm down onto the table. The prisoner's expression faltered, the confidence melting away to confusion, then concern as Calvin drew one of his drills. He wasted no time in positioning the bit against the back of the guy's hand. Wait, no, 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 the guard shrieked, and then his words turned to garbled screams as Calvin drilled down into his hand, securing it to the table. The cowboy released the bit, slamming his drill down next to the bleeding carnage, and slapped his palms back onto the table. Listen up, you ignorant motherfucker, he snarled. You assholes have already trashed my baby, shot at me, punched me, and thrown me across the room like I'm a fucking rag doll. So unless you want to help me relieve more stress by drilling every single appendage you have to the goddamn furniture, you will fucking tell me where Edward is. The guard's mouth opened and closed like a fish, and he squeaked as his pale face broke out in a sheen of sweat. Okay, okay, he huffed, writhing against his bonds. He's in the courthouse. Calvin leaned closer, eyes like steel. Do I look like I know where the fuck the courthouse is? He demanded. It's, it's, the guard seethed. It's south of the interstate, a few blocks maybe. Calvin stood up straight, planting his hands on his hips. Now do we have to be worried about your buddies out there? He asked, motioning outside. Like over at the hotel by the bridge? No, no, just a couple of patrols, the guard assured him, head bopping up and down like a bobblehead. Calvin slammed his hands down on the table again. Bullshit, we know that there's all kinds of activity at the hotel. He grabbed his drill and squeezed the trigger a few times, enjoying the look of pure fear in his prisoner's face. Get the other hand. The man thrashed as Zion reached for his other arm. It's just our families, he screamed. I swear it's just our families. Calvin paused and locked eyes with his partner, who nodded in approval. The cowboy holstered his drill as the guard broke down into sobs, 
his bravado long dissipated. The duo stepped away from the table and leaned together. Do you believe him? Calvin asked. Sion nodded. Yeah, I think he's telling the truth, he admitted. Makes sense to keep the families near the river. A horde pops up and they can get to the water pretty easily. I'll buy that, Calvin agreed. So what's the play? Zion inclined his head to their prisoners. We leave them tied up and see if we can get to the courthouse to have a chat with Edward. Let's do it, his partner agreed and nodded firmly. As they broke apart, Zion put his hand on his friend's shoulder. Hey, you good? You okay? Yep, I'm calm, Calvin replied confidently. Zion raised an eyebrow, blinking at him. You're calm? You should see what I'd do to him if I wasn't. His partner replied with a laugh and winked at him. He headed over to the prisoners to make sure they were secure, and Zion scratched the back of his head, hoping that his friend wasn't cracking up. Chapter 11 Zion and Calvin ducked down behind some trees on the edge of the interstate. They looked across to scan several rows of buildings, making up the small business district of the town. Calvin pulled out his rifle, peering through the scope to do a thorough sweep. There were a few patrols, both on foot and in vehicles, moving about. How we looking? Zion asked. Calvin shook his head in dismay. Whole lot of company, he replied. Think he was telling the truth about the courthouse? His partner asked. Calvin nodded. If they have that many people keeping watch, it's a good bet that Edward's there. So what you thinking? Zion cocked his head. Calvin continued staring through the scope, honing in on a storefront with broken windows. He moved his head so his partner could look through and see. Get into the stores and move through it? Zion asked as he looked. I like it. Calvin nodded. I figured that would give us a chance to check out the area, too. That's a hell of a run across the interstate and through the parking lot to get there, though, Zion pointed out, tapping his chin. His partner motioned ahead. Looks like there's a ditch on the other side of the road, he suggested. Should give us enough cover for the patrol to pass. Zion thought about it for a moment, lips pursed. He wasn't thrilled with the idea, but it seemed like there was little other in the way of options. Fuck it, he said. Let's do it. Calvin shouldered his gun, and they crouched, ready to spring, waiting for the current patrol to get out of sight. As soon as they were clear, they burst out of the bushes and sprinted across the road. As they hopped the median barrier, an engine rumbled in the distance, lighting a fire under their asses to haul across the rest of the highway. As they approached the ditch, they slid across the shoulder like they were stealing second, falling off of the dirt and into the grass, laying as flat as they could. They breathed heavily, waiting for any signal that their cover had been blown. The car rumbled closer, and then as it faded in the other direction, they let out simultaneous sighs of relief. That was close, Calvin huffed. Zion nodded as he caught his breath. Too close, he agreed. Not ready to start killing just yet. He motioned for his partner to lay low as he pulled himself up over the edge of the ditch, their target was about 60 yards away, and he peered through the blades of grass to watch the foot patrol coming around the side of the building. They casually walked past the broken window, not even giving it a second look. As they continued to walk, Zion motioned for Calvin to get ready next to him. As soon as he saw the guards turn the corner, he raised his hand, and they sprinted through the grass and into the parking lot, rushing the window. As they grew close, the patrol car's engine returned, coming around the building. They pushed harder, reaching the window and leaping blindly through it into the darkened store. They landed hard and stayed down, out of sight, breathing hard as they waited for the car to roll past. They shook their heads at each other, amazed they'd made it through the small window of opportunity, let alone the actual window they targeted. Zion nodded at Calvin, who gave him a thumbs up, and they began to move. The clothing store was dark, the only light coming from the front windows. They moved through it quickly, assuming that with the broken window, the guards would have taken care of any potential threats. As they got to the storefront, 
They ducked against either side of the giant front display of mannequins showing off the latest fashion trends. They studied the area carefully, scanning a typical small downtown street filled with shops and restaurants. As they waited, the foot patrol walked by, and they hid again. Looks like they're just walking in circles, Zion whispered. Calvin shrugged. Good work if you can get it, I guess, he murmured. They peeked back out after a beat and noticed a storefront across the way with a swinging door blowing gently open in the breeze. I don't know about that one, Calvin said quietly. Zion chewed his lip for a moment. Well, it's either that, we break a window, or stay on the street with the patrols. I don't like any of those either, his partner admitted. With the other two options, we're pretty much guaranteed to get caught, Zion pointed out. So do you want a surefire fight, or merely a likely one? Calvin shook his head with a snort. The fun never stops with you, does it? Zion grinned. You know you'd rather be hanging out with me than being back on the farm fighting badgers or whatever the fuck they were. I know my buddy would, Calvin admitted. If he were doing this instead of fighting those critters, he'd still have his nipple. Zion blinked at him and shook his head. When we get back, you're telling me that story. Deal, Calvin replied with a smile. They crept to the front door, and the sniper removed his rifle just in case of trouble, clicking the lock open as they waited for the patrol car to drive by. As soon as it turned the corner, they flung open the door and rushed out into the street, sprinting towards the swinging one across the way. Just before they reached it, a voice from above screeched, Stop right there! They skidded to a stop and looked up behind them, noting one lone guard standing on the roof above the clothing store. Calvin immediately raised his rifle, pointing it at the guy, who hadn't had the wherewithal to even raise his weapon. Drop it now, Calvin demanded. The guard immediately dropped his gun and lifted his hands in the air. Now we're gonna keep on going, and you're not gonna do a goddamn thing, you got it? The cowboy asked, voice like venom. The guard nodded frantically. Yeah, I'm not gonna do anything. The duo backed up towards the door, but it was too late as the foot patrol came around the corner. Stop, there, somebody yelled. Calvin reacted immediately, firing down the street, shattering a window right next to the guards. As soon as it exploded and they ducked, he and Zion tore for the door. Gunfire filled the air several shots whizzing by them as they burst inside. Zion quickly shoved it back and locked it, and they darted further in before skidding to a stop at the dozen or so guys sitting in the restaurant, frozen in a tableau of utensils scooping food into their mouths. Zion blinked at the display. Um, he said sheepishly. Who do I talk to about getting a to-go order? Two men at a nearby table immediately leapt up and rushed him. He swung his weapon at kneecap level, plowing the rebar-enforced wood through both of them. The first impact shattered the man's joint, resulting in a horrific scream, and softened the blow for the second, however still with enough momentum to send them both to the floor. A few others got up from their tables to move towards the duo, but a woman behind the counter pulled a shotgun and fired it into the air. As the dust settled and all the eyes moved to her, she cried, We ain't doing this in my place. She aimed the gun at Zion, who froze. Ideas? Calvin asked as the door behind them thumped. The foot patrol guards held up their guns, aiming through the glass at their back. Zion slowly raised his hands. Surrender. Calvin sighed and carefully laid down his gun before lifting his hands as well. Look, all we came here to do was to talk to Edward, Zion said as the guards approached them, patting them down and putting them in cuffs. Well, he don't want to talk to you, one of the guards replied gruffly. Zion raised an eyebrow. We came here to help solve his little problem across the river, he added. A few of the guards looked at each other, contemplating silently between them. All right, one of them said. We'll run it by him and let you know. Calvin cocked his head. How do we know if he agrees? If we don't shoot you in the back of the head, the guard replied with a sneer. 
You'll know he wants to see you. Chapter 12 The guards led Zion and Calvin into the small courthouse, their hands cuffed in front of them. The building looked like it had been built in the 70s, with a concrete facade and faux marble flooring. Adorning the walls were portraits of the city council and mayor, most of whom were probably dead or undead. They stopped at an intersection of hallways, and one of the guards shoved Zion hard in the back. He turned around and glared at his captor. You shove me like that again, and you're gonna have to rely on your buddies to avenge you. The guard gulped, eyes wide, and nodded his apology. Zion turned, satisfied, and continued down the hall. When they reached the end, there was a large office door with a frosted glass window. One of the guards knocked on it, and there was a muffled noise of approval from the other side. Wait here, the guard said, and slipped in through the door. There was some muffled conversation, and then after a few moments, it opened. Today's your lucky day, the guard said with a dark smile. Edward has agreed to hear you out. Good, Zion replied, and led Calvin into the office. It was a nice room, corner of the building, though the windows had been reinforced with wooden planks for safety. Not exactly statuesque, but functional. In the back of the room, a middle-aged white man with slicked brown hair and deep-set eyes sat behind an oak desk filled with papers. There were a few assistants sitting at a table against the side wall, scribbling away. You'll have to forgive me, the man, presumably Edward, said, waving at the people along the side of the room. This is going to have to be a short chat, because I'm juggling half a dozen shit shows at the moment and don't have a lot of time for outsiders looking to make trouble in our little community. Zion cocked a brow. Well, for starters, he drawled, your boys were the ones who started the trouble. One well-thrown pipe bomb and my baby is damaged and submerged in the goddamn river, Calvin added. Edward stopped shuffling papers and looked up at them, brow furrowed. Somebody blew up your baby? His truck, Zion clarified. Edward sighed, shaking his head, and got up from his desk, circling it to approach them. You'll have to forgive them, he said, pressing his palms together as if in prayer. We've had some issues with the people across the river hoarding supplies, so my men are on edge when it comes to people they don't know. That's not the way they tell it, Zion replied. Edward nodded, leaning back on his desk casually. I'm sure it isn't, he agreed. But regardless of the he said, she said, the fact of the matter is that they killed and maimed several of my men, which means they're a problem I need handled. Now, according to my man here, you have a solution to that problem, which is why we're having this little chat. He clucked his tongue. Now, is that true? It is, but it's a little confusing, Zion admitted. Edward raised an eyebrow. How so? Well, you got a small army of trigger-happy assholes at your disposal, his prisoner replied. Seems like you should be able to take them out without much problem. Edward sighed. You're probably right, he admitted. But as I mentioned earlier, I have half a dozen shit shows I'm juggling. I have 185 people I'm responsible for. Our food supply is running low, and we're having issues securing a long-term solution. I have several zombie clusters to the south of us that are taking a lot of my resources. I'm also running low on medical supplies, since the hospital in this area was little more than a souped-up pharmacy. So while I can overrun them, it's not worth sacrificing the manpower to do so. Which is why you're here. Do you have a solution for me? Or should I just have my men pop you in the back of the head and toss you into the river? He crossed his arms. Sion smiled. Okay, Edward. Before we get going here, he said, inclining his head to his partner. I'm Zion, and this is my buddy Calvin. Delighted, their captor replied, waving his hand dismissively. Go on. Not only do I have a solution to your Cross River problem, I may have a solution to some of your other problems as well, Zion continued. You see, Edward held up a hand. One step at a time, he said shortly. Let's deal with my immediate problem you claim to have a fix for, 
before you start offering me more miracle solutions than a late-night infomercial host. Fair enough, Zion agreed. We're from Portland, just north of the city, and we have a collection of communities under our protection. We'd be willing to let the group to the north join us and get out of your hair for good. Edward crossed his arms, nodding. I think I can work with that. Before you get too excited, Zion added, there's a couple of conditions on that. His captor motioned for him to continue. I would expect nothing less, he said. State your terms. For starters, we get free passage out of town, Zion began, with the understanding that if anybody takes a shot at us, we'll come back here in force and burn this motherfucker to the ground, women and children all. Edward didn't even blink at the threat, just simply nodded in agreement. Second, Zion continued, 25% of that hardware store comes with us. The man thought for a moment and then shook his head. 20% and no more than 20% of any specific item. What if there's only one of an item? Zion asked. Edward paused again, staring into his prisoner's eyes in appraisal. I leave it to your discretion and trust you'll make it up to me in future negotiations. Zion stared him down for a moment and then smiled. I can live with that. Anything else? Edward asked. His prisoner turned business partner nodded. Yeah, we're gonna need a couple of trucks, he said. One for what we're hauling out of town and one to replace my friend's ride with. I'll even throw in a full tank of gas on each, Edward replied. Zion extended his cuffed hands to shake, which Edward accepted and then motioned to one of the guards. Why don't you uncuff our friends here and start getting the trucks they need, he suggested. But before the guard could comply, another guard burst into the room, eyes frantic. No, please, come on in, Edward declared, rolling his eyes with sarcasm. We weren't doing anything of importance anyway. We, we have a problem, the guard stammered. It's zombies. Great, Edward replied with a sigh. Another cluster to the north? The guard vigorously shook his head. There are hundreds on the interstate coming this way. How close, Edward demanded, eyes turning hard. When the guard didn't reply, he stepped forward and shook him. How close, man? Maybe a couple of miles, came the shaky reply. I was stationed at the rest stop and saw them coming. Edward clenched his jaw. Must be from the Dalles, he muttered. You sure it's only a few hundred? Yeah, I could see the tail end of them, but it was a ways back, the guard replied quickly. Edward glanced at the handful of men at the door. Pull everyone you can and tell them to get geared up. I will, but the beach guards are in the infirmary, one replied. Edward's brow furrowed. Infirmary? He glanced at the cuffed duo. What did you guys do? Accidentally concussed one of them, Zion replied casually and my buddy here connected the other one's hand to the table with a drill bit. Edward glared at Calvin. How in the holy hell did you think that was okay to do? He called my friend here a monkey boy, Calvin shot back, and I wasn't going to stand for it. Edward clucked his tongue. That was probably Billy, he said with a sigh. That should knock the racism out of him. If you'd like, I could head up this little operation for you, Zion piped up. Both Edward and Calvin gaped at him. Our friends to the north can help out as well, Zion continued. We just need some rides and a couple of gunmen. Calvin raised his still cuffed hands. And your pipe bomb maker. Edward threw a nod at the cluster of guards. Get them whatever they need, he said. If those things are at the rest stop, they'll be here within an hour. One of you get the families on lockdown at the hotel. They all rushed out of the room, and Edward approached the duo making quick work of their cuffs himself. We'll get this mess cleaned up for you, then get out of your hair, Zion said as he freed his wrists. If you'd like, I can come back down in a couple of days and we can talk about your needs and how I can help. Edward extended his hand. Tomorrow's out, but the day after that I'm good. You like steak? Damn right I do, Zion replied with a smile as they shook. Edward nodded. Come down around lunch and I'll take you over to Annie's. Unless there are multiple restaurants in town, Zion replied with a grimace. She might not be too happy to see me, 
as we kind of forced her to shoot a shotgun into her ceiling. Edward waved his hands. Just bring her a bottle of whiskey and she'll forgive you. Zion chuckled. I can do that. Be safe and we'll see you soon, Edward replied, dismissing them as he circled back around his desk. The duo nodded to each other and headed out the door, ready for a fresh zombie assault. Chapter 13 Zion rode in the lead truck of a caravan of three, all the way into White Salmon. The man behind the wheel was a gruff-looking man in his early fifties and didn't seem interested at all in talking. Zion was okay with that, though he missed Calvin's chatter. Stop two blocks up, he directed. The driver scowled. I know where we're going. Then you ought to know where you boys got your asses handed to you and why you shouldn't be driving up on it, Zion shot back, which is why I told you where to stop. The driver shook his head. Relax, boy, you're with us now, he replied, condescension in his tone. They ain't gonna do- He stopped short as a wooden stake smashed through the window, embedding itself in the driver's seat right next to the man's head. Zion immediately hopped out of the truck, waving his arms above his head. Harold, it's me, he yelled. Calm down, man. Oh, sorry, Harold called back. You okay? Zion nodded, keeping his hands up to make sure the other truck stopped behind him. Yeah, I'm good, he assured him. Stand down for me, will ya? Harold gave him a thumbs up through the opening, and Zion leaned back into the truck. Maybe next time your dumbass will listen to me, he asked. It doesn't matter if I'm with you or not, if they don't know that I am. The driver shook his head at his own stupidity and sighed heavily as Zion slammed the passenger door. Dumbass, he muttered to himself as everyone got out of the trucks. What the hell, man? One of the guards demanded as he helped the shell-shocked driver disengage his shirt sleeve from the wooden stake that had just missed him. Zion stared pointedly at the driver. Go on, tell him what a dumbass you are, he said. The guard hung his head. Yeah, and this was my fault. All right, Zion declared. I want you guys to hang tight while I go explain the situation. Calvin raised a hand. Could probably use the bomber, he suggested. He might have some ideas. Good point, Zion agreed and looked around. So which one of you is my bomber? A tall and lean blonde kid stepped forward, no older than Zion himself. Yep, that's me, he said. Zion cocked his head. What's your name? Everybody just calls me Fingers, the kid replied with a shrug. Zion raised an eyebrow. Fingers? The kid raised his hands, revealing only seven and a half fingers between both of them. Yeah, let's just say I had a steep learning curve on these beauties, he said with a grin. Guess we should just be thankful you never dropped one in your lap, Zion replied. Fingers shook his head. You ain't kidding. Come on, Zion said, and waved for him to follow. They headed inside where Tori and her group waited, looking concerned. She crossed her arms. What are they doing here? She asked. They're here because they need our help, Zion replied. Tori growled. Need our help? She snapped. After attacking us? Yep, there's a horde a few hundred strong coming up the interstate, Zion replied. I told him we'd help take them down. Jack shifted his weight. And then what? Then the four of you are gonna come back with me to Portland, Zion explained. Get you set up in a nice apartment in my building. Tori put her hands on her hips. That's the deal you cut, she demanded. Best you could do? Yeah, Zion replied with a nod. But I was also able to get you 20% of the store, so whatever you want. She turned to the others, and they all suddenly looked tired, tired from being on guard and fighting all the time. Might be nice to feel safe, Missy said. Jack nodded. No more waking up in the middle of the night because we hear a sound. Or having to stay up all night on watch, Harold added. Tori nodded at them and turned back to the others. Thank you, she said, and took a deep breath. Now what do you need us to do? Well, if you have a way to thin out a several hundred zombie horde, that would be a great start, Zion replied. 
She pushed her glasses up her nose. How much time do we have? Maybe an hour, he said. Harold scratched his head. Well, the stake thrower isn't going to do much against a group that size, but I can modify it to shoot something larger, he said. Maybe something up to 10 pounds? How much power behind it? Missy asked. It'll have enough power to punch through several of those things, he replied. She glanced at the wall, appraising several spindles of chain hanging there. Would it have enough to pull a secondary weight, one connected by a chain? She motioned to the spools. Harold thought for a moment and then nodded, his eyes lighting up. Oh yeah, I think I can make that happen, he said, a smile growing on his face. Set the back weight off center so when it goes out, it'll rotate and we can get a several foot spinning death radius. Zion rubbed his forehead. I suppose that sounds good. It's going to rock, Missy declared. He shrugged. What do you need? Every 10 pound and under dumbbell you can get your hands on, Harold replied. Calvin stepped forward. Is there a gym in town? I think there's one three blocks up, Tori replied. Calvin, Zion began. The cowboy put up a hand. I'll get everything they have. He headed out the door, and his partner turned back to the group. What else do you need? Zion asked. Tori shook her head. It's a shame we don't have any explosives, she said. Sounds like someone's talking my language, Fingers piped up and took a step forward. He took Tori's hand and kissed her knuckles with a grin. She blinked at him blankly, in shock by the gesture, and then looked down at his hand missing a finger and a half. Jack scoffed. And who are you, he demanded. Name's Fingers, the kid replied with a little wave. Explosives expert extraordinaire at your service. Oh, good to know, Tori replied, a small blush creeping up her cheeks. Thank you? She adjusted her glasses even though they hadn't moved. My pleasure, Fingers replied. I'm glad you have an interest in my particular hobby, but I'm unsure of how exactly pipe bombs are going to be effective here. I haven't had much luck using them against a group of zombies. Jack crossed his arms. Probably because you lack imagination. Well, by all means, sir, enlighten me, Fingers replied, spreading his arms. Jack inclined his head. You got one on you? Fingers held up one of his half digits and reached into his back pocket, pulling out a 10-inch bomb and tossing it over. Metal PVC does a pretty good job of shattering, but not in nearly enough pieces to do much damage. Jack turned it over in his hands and then tossed it back. Meet me at the counter. While you're there, dig up some tape from behind it, if you would. Happily, Fingers replied, intrigue on his face. He headed off to the counter, and Jack headed over to the shelf containing nuts and bolts. He tore the plastic backing off of a spindle and started packing it full of a wide variety of nuts, bolts, and nails. After a moment, he headed back over to the counter and set it down. What do you think? he asked. Fingers stared for a moment, and then flattened out the plastic bag, setting his bomb on top of it. Then he rolled it up like a burrito, a grin widening on his face. Oh, we're gonna have some fun today, he said. So that'll work? Tori asked. He nodded. And then some, he promised. We're gonna need something to protect ourselves, though, because my goodies pack quite the punch. The last thing we want is getting taken out by our own weapons. There are some plexiglass sheets in the back, Jack said. Pretty sure I can rig us up something. Fingers nodded. If there's enough to spare, double it up just to be safe. I think that can be arranged, Jack replied. Why don't you come give me a hand to make sure it's gonna be thick enough? The explosives expert slipped out from behind the counter. With pleasure. As they left, Tori turned to Zion. Thank you for everything you're doing. It's what I do he replied, and then shrugged. At least these days. She cocked her head. You mean you haven't always gone out of your way to save total strangers? <laughs> if only you knew, he replied with a dark chuckle. She pushed her glasses up her nose. Well, regardless of what you were pre-apocalypse, you're a hell of a good man now. His mouth went dry, and he shrugged it off, uncomfortable with her praise. 
So uh, what can I do to help? Well, you can help me get this large air compressor into a truck bed, Tori replied, okay with changing the subject to avoid awkwardness. He nodded and headed for the door. Done. I'll get the truck. She laughed and shook her head, impressed with herself that she was able to throw such a beast of a human being off of his game with a little adoration. Chapter 14 The three trucks rumbled down the interstate towards the horde. As they came around a bend, they saw the front edge of them. Most of the stumbling corpses were on the westbound lane, with a small cluster on the eastbound. Let's hold up here, Zion instructed, and the driver nodded, rolling down his window and waving his hand at the trailing vehicles. They stopped in the road so he could do a three-point turn, the back of the truck facing the oncoming ghouls. Harold, Missy, and Jack hopped out of another vehicle and rushed to the reverse truck with the air compressor in the back. Leave it up there, Harold said, waving towards the machine. Missy, Zion, help me unload the gun. Zion nodded. On it. He headed over to help. Jack, get the power going, Harold instructed, and the taller man set to work while the other three gently lifted the large modified gun out and set it gently on the ground next to the truck. Jack jumped into the front cab and opened the back sliding window, reaching out and grabbing the power cable. He attached it to the makeshift adapter that he then plugged into the lighter socket. You're juiced up, he called. Just don't turn it on until you absolutely need it because it's going to drain the battery pretty quick. Harold nodded. I'll give you a two-minute warning before we need to fire. Jack gave him a thumbs up from the driver's side window. Zion watched as Harold and Missy set up the gun and platform. Harold took a five-pound weight with a chain connected to it and slid it into the new, larger barrel. His partner set up a simple wooden platform next to it, setting the other five-pound weight on it. You sure this is going to work? Zion asked. Missy nodded with a grin. Oh yeah, it's just a modified version of the chain shot. She turned to him at his look of confusion. It was used in the Civil War as anti-personnel munitions, as well as by various navies and pirates to take out ship masts. We had a whole chapter on it back in high school. Let's just say you and I had very, very different education options growing up, Zion replied, poking his tongue into his cheek. She paused and then nodded, not wanting to push the issue. As they set up the gun, Calvin, Fingers, and Tori came up from the other truck, flanked by two guards carrying large sheets of plexiglass-like shields. Metal handles had been attached to them so they could hold them up. You guys ready to rock? Zion asked. Calvin raised a fist. Oh yeah, we got a dozen of these pipe bombs ready to go, he said. The trick is going to be getting them to explode in the air over the zombies, and not on the ground, Tori said thoughtfully. Fingers grinned. Don't worry, I've become quite adept at timing these blasts, he assured her. Says the man missing three fingers, Calvin quipped. The explosives expert winked at him. How do you think I became adept? He headed towards the horde with a bag full of bombs. Calvin shook his head and laughed, heading after him with Tori and the shielders in tow. If you can manage it, try to space out your targets, Zion instructed. Chances are we're going to have to get down and dirty with these motherfuckers at some point, so having them spread out will make my life easier. Calvin nodded. You got it. They continued to move up, the horde slowly shambling towards them. The stench wafting towards them was overwhelming, the sun baking their rotted flesh, radiating on the blacktop. Even though it was a fairly cool day in the Pacific Northwest, it didn't take much to set the smells off. Calvin and Fingers stood shoulder to shoulder, about 50 yards from the front edge of the horde. They each held a bomb in their hand and a lighter in the other. You know, I'm still pissed at you for blowing up my baby, the cowboy said with a sniff. Fingers inclined his head, an apologetic expression on his face. That's an understandable sentiment he admitted. How long have you had her? Going on 12 years now, Calvin replied with a sigh. Fingers shook his head. Yeah, I've had mine for 14 years, he replied. 
She's got a lot of dings on her, but I've kept her patched up pretty good. Is that an offer to repair the damage you caused? The cowboy asked, raising an eyebrow. Fingers chuckled. Might need some help from you to procure some parts, but I'll help you fix her up, he offered. I'm good with that, Calvin agreed. Tori approached with the two drivers carrying their plexiglass shields. One of them handed her a panel, and the trio of shielders stepped up to join them. You two ready to do this? She asked, pushing her glasses up on her nose. The zombies were within 40 yards and gaining. I don't know about my new buddy here, but I'm not exactly a pro quarterback, Calvin admitted. We're gonna have to move up some unless you want us to just hit the front line. Fingers wrinkled his nose. Agreed, he said. I got enough problems without tearing my rotator cuff. The group walked forward and stopped at about 20 yards. Here looks good, Calvin asked. Fingers nodded. I can work with that. How long of a fuse you got on these? The cowboy asked, turning one over in his hand. The explosives expert held one up, showing him the glinting fuse in the sunlight. I trimmed them down, so we're at 10 seconds. Throw on six, Calvin wondered. Fingers wiggled his head back and forth. I'd say seven. The cowboy took a deep breath. A little concerning coming from someone with seven fingers. Well, the explosives expert replied with a smirk. There's a reason I didn't say eight. Calvin chuckled. Fair enough. He shook his head. Seven it is. So how are we doing the shields? Fingers asked. Tori held hers up. I figured I'll get these two to stand on either side of me, and I'll get behind one of them, she replied, motioning between the two drivers. When you throw, you step through the hole and take cover, and I'll step up. Fuck it, Calvin replied. Sounds like a plan to me. They took their positions, the bombers standing in front, readying their lighters. Tori looked over at the drivers. Remember to angle them up and out, but not too high, she said showing them with her own shield. We don't want any of the projectiles to bounce off of the pavement and sneak in underneath. They both nodded, and she took a deep breath. All right, Tori announced, pushing her glasses up firmly onto her nose. Light them up. The bombers nodded at each other, and then simultaneously lit their fuses. They began counting down from ten in unison, rearing back their arms at five. Four, they counted. Three! They tossed the bombs in a high arc over the horde, one to the left and the other to the right. As soon as they let go, they darted back behind the protective wall. Just as Tori slipped into position, a massive boom racked the interstate. They watched through the scuffed plexiglass as both bombs detonated about ten feet over the zombie mass, about fifteen yards deep. The blast sent hardware shrapnel ripping through rotted skin and bone, with a couple dozen creatures dropping to the ground from headshots. The rest lost limbs or massive chunks of their faces, some staggering along like pincushions, nails sticking out of their shoulders. There was a significant gap made in the lead group of 30 and the next batch, the fallen zombies not only creating a hole, but causing their brethren to stumble over them. Fingers lit another bomb. What are you doing? Tori demanded. He held up a hand. Trust me, he said, and keep those shields flat on the ground. He stepped around the shielders and underhand tossed the bomb over the front line of ghouls, landing it in the gap, right in the center of the line. A few seconds passed, and there was another large explosion, this time dropping eight zombies in the center leaving little more than a dozen on each side of the road. Zion, you're up, Fingers called. Zion didn't waste time, seeing the small groups that the explosives had created. He grabbed his new trusty weapon and rushed to the group on the right. As he did, Fingers pulled out his handgun, one of the shielders passing off to Calvin to do the same. You back Zion up, Fingers instructed his companion, and I'll handle the other side. The guard turned to the right but paused. Zion was like a hulking beast, swinging his weapon and demolishing trios of zombies with single blows. The sun glistened off of his dark skin as he fought, wild glee on his face like a madman as he took down corpse after corpse. Uh, I think he's good, 
the guard said. Fingers glanced over, and his eyebrows hit his hairline as he watched Zion in action, taking out zombie heads like it was an Olympic sport. He nodded at the guard, and he joined him instead. They stood side by side, popping off shots to systematically take out the ghouls as they approached one by one. When the two split groups were merely piles of unmoving corpses, the trio sauntered back to the bombers, and Zion held out his hand. Light me up, one of them, he said. Fingers pulled a pipe bomb out and produced his lighter. We've been throwing on seven, he said. No offense, Zion replied, but I'm pretty sure I can throw on six. I want to thin them out towards the back. Fingers shrugged. Six will work. He lit the fuse, and Zion started counting as he took the bomb. When he hit six, he reeled back and chucked it, sailing through the air over the horde and nearly reaching the back end of the mass. It exploded in an epic display of glittering nuts and bolts, dropping a good number of the enemy. Hit me one more time, Zion said, and held out his hand again. Fingers lit a second one, and Zion counted again, this time throwing with a little less power. The bomb detonated a few feet above the crowd, shredding heads and torsos with the blast. Let's get back to the trucks, Zion instructed, as the front end of the horde reached the 15-yard line. I want everybody to move up about 50 yards to prepare for another round. The group gathered their ballistics and jogged back to the vehicles. On the way, Zion smacked a few heads with his mighty weapon as he came across a straggler or two. By the time they fell, a significant number of zombies had managed to bypass the clumps of their fallen brethren. As he reached the truck, he regarded Harold, who stood behind his gun. This thing good to go? Zion asked. The gunner nodded firmly. Whenever they're within 20 yards, we'll fire it up. Guessing you don't have rapid fire with this bad boy? Zion pursed his lips. Missy shook her head. It's easy enough to reload, just have to stuff another weight into the chamber. She held up a second dumbbell. And it only needs 15 seconds to power back up, Harold added. Zion nodded thoughtfully. Okay, well, we aren't going to be taking any chances. He held up two fingers. So two shots, we load up, and then we move back. No argument here, Harold agreed. Missy nodded. Me either. Zion smiled, appraising the gun with excitement. He couldn't believe the death and destruction these nerdy college kids could bring to the table. He couldn't help but admit to himself. He was stoked to be bringing them into the fold back at the complex. The horde approached, reaching 30 yards. Jack, fire us up, Harold called. His companion held a thumbs up out the window. Here we go, he said, and plugged in the compressor. It sprang to life, and the pressure built up in the cannon with a sucking noise. The creatures inched their way ever closer as the gun readied, shambling towards their brain-dead fate. Missy, you good? Harold asked. She was already kneeling, holding on to the makeshift wooden base that the other chained weight sat on. Ready, she declared. Firing in five, Harold began and braced himself. Four, three, two, one. He hit the switch, and the gun let out a deafening boom. The dumbbell flew from the gun, the three-foot chain whipping behind it, ripping the other weight from the pedestal. The spinning instrument of destruction hurtled towards the horde, sparkling in the sun as it spun. One of the weights caught a creature directly in the face, tearing through it like tissue paper. The stretch of chain easily sliced through the rotted mass like butter, taking off several dozen heads and cutting through some torsos of taller zombies. Before it lost momentum, it had easily penetrated 15 feet into the mass, knocking down an impressive array of creatures. Fuck yeah, man, Zion exclaimed, throwing his hands in the air. Woo, let's get another one loaded up. Missy and Harold were already loading up another shot, the mass closing in on 15 yards away. As the air compressor powered up again, Harold aimed towards the left of the horde at an angle. Firing in five, he began, taking a deep breath. Four, three, two, one. 
He hit the trigger again, and the loud boom shook him as the chain took off like a shot, shredding several dozen zombies. Zion let out another celebratory yell, clenching a fist in the air. I know I just met you, but I love y'all so much right now, he admitted, shaking his head as he stepped towards the gun. No time to waste, though. Let's get this in the truck. He and Harold lifted it carefully, putting it up in the bed, and Missy heaved the wooden platform up behind them. The zombies were ten yards away, giving them some room to clamber up into the truck bed to safety. Jack, fire it up and get out, Zion called. I'm gonna pick off the stragglers. The answer to his call was a clicking sound from the engine that made all of their guts roil with dread. Battery's dead, Jack yelled from the driver's seat, panicked. Fuck, Zion said as he hopped down from the truck bed. Throw it in neutral and get your ass out here. Jack scrambled out of the driver's seat, and Missy hopped down to take his place behind the wheel. Harold joined Zion and Jack at the back, and the three of them pushed as hard as they could. With the heavy air compressor, it was difficult to get the beastly vehicle moving, even with all of them. Push, Zion urged, push. The truck inched forward, and he looked over his shoulder. Several zombies were as close as five yards away, arms outstretched and mouths open with hungry excitement. He grabbed his weapon from the tailgate and whipped around, swinging at the lead zombie. He caught it in the side of the head, and it tumbled to the ground. Zion used the momentum of the massive swing to spin completely around, weapon outstretched, beheading one creature and hitting the final nearby ghoul in the shoulder. He dispatched it with a final smash to the face and then rushed back to the truck to lend his strength. As the truck began to move at a semi-decent roll, Fingers and Calvin ran up from their vantage point. They lit up bombs and whipped them as hard as they could, immediately lighting up two more and tossing them at slightly different angles, far into the mass. What are you doing? Zion demanded. Fingers shook his head. Slowing them down. The explosions happened rapidly, one after the other, sending rotted limbs up into the air, dropping patches of creatures. Not many took headshots, the bulk of the damage done to torsos and limbs, but it thinned them out a little bit and broke up the main bunch. Zion grabbed his weapon again and surveyed the still hundred-strong lumbering horde, stepping back from the truck as Jack and Harold pushed it fairly well on their own. How many more of those bombs you got? he asked. Fingers counted. Six. How about bullets? Zion asked. The explosives expert patted his pocket. Got two mags. Zion nodded. I can work with that, he said. Calvin, start chucking those things as far as you can and let them hit the ground. Fingers, you're with me. The duo headed towards the front group, about 15, while Calvin lit a bomb and tossed it as hard as he could. Shoot every third zombie, and I'll take care of the other two, Zion instructed. Fingers pulled his handgun and walked side by side with a melee fighter towards the small pack to the side that didn't get hit with the chain weapon. Say the word, Fingers prompted, ready on the trigger. Hit him, Zion said. Fingers took aim, firing off three shots in rapid succession, splitting the zombies up into several pairs of two that had a few feet between each other. Zion lunged forward like a rocket, swinging his weapon and knocking one head into the other, the rebar caving in a skull at the temple. He easily surged down, taking out the creature on the ground. The next duo staggered towards him quickly, but he had enough time and space to repeat the process, this time knocking them back into another pair, sending all of them tumbling onto their rotted asses. One by one, he stepped up and cracked his weapon straight down, smashing heads one by one. Meanwhile, Calvin lit bombs and tossed them as hard as he could, as far as he could, explosions sending ghouls and limbs scattering on the blacktop battlefield. The trio backed up several steps to survey the damage. Another group of eight zombies had separated from the others and lumbered up the right side. Let's hit this one real quick, Zion said, motioning with his weapon. Fingers aimed and fired two quick shots, clearing the way for Zion to decimate more heads while Calvin threw more bombs. 
By the time they backed up again, there were only half a dozen small groups of eight or less still moving. Some staggered, others crawled on the ground, their legs shredded. Looks like we got them right where we want them, Fingers declared. Zion nodded, impressed. Still got a little bit of work to do, though. I'm not a fan of how many of those things are crawling, Calvin added. Zion shrugged. Me either, he admitted, and jerked his thumb over his shoulder. What do you say we grab one of those trucks and roll through them real quick? Might have to hit a car wash after we're wrapped up, Fingers replied. But it's a lot better than getting bit on the ankles. Calvin raised a hand. I'll go grab us one. He jogged off behind them. You did real good out here, man, Zion said, turning to the explosives expert. Fingers shrugged. Not my first rodeo, but I appreciate the sentiment. Well, if you ever get tired of living in white salmon and want a change of scenery, Zion said with a smirk, or if you just want to blow up bigger and better things, I got a place for you. The explosives expert nodded thoughtfully. Thanks for the offer, he said. I'll keep it in mind. They stared out at the horde, something that might have been a life-altering sight a few weeks ago. Now it was just another day in the apocalypse. Chapter 15 Calvin drove his loner truck towards the complex, with Jack and Harold in the passenger seat. Tori followed with Zion and Missy in the second truck. The beds were loaded up with stacks and boxes of goods from the hardware store. It's so pretty up here, Missy said, staring out the window at the lush trees and grass. Tori grinned, pushing her glasses up her nose. Helps that there are significantly less people here shooting at us, too, she added. That's always a plus, Zion said. Missy's brow furrowed, and she pointed out at a few zombies wandering in the woods. Oh, I think I just saw... Don't worry, Zion assured her. We got it under control up here. He pointed up ahead, towards a trainee search party weaving their way through woods, picking off stragglers. He reached over and honked the horn, prompting a few of them to turn and wave, big smiles on their faces. Tori smiled. Looks like you're quite the leader here. Nah, Zion replied, waving her off. I'm just doing what needs to be done. If I'm being honest, a lot of this is due to my sister, Monique. She's the one who pushed me to bring people together. Tori chuckled, shaking her head. Well, I know plenty of siblings that would ignore their other half, even if they were told that the stovetop was hot, she teased. So it's commendable that you took her message to heart. Appreciate that. Zion replied, staring at the complex coming around the bend. Missy's jaw dropped at the sight of the apartments. That's where we're going to be living? She exclaimed. Yep, that's home, Zion replied, a hint of pride in his voice. Tori's eyes were wide. Definitely a step up from the dorms. And a really big step up from the back of a small town hardware store, Missy added. Tori laughed. Darn right. Zion smiled and couldn't help but feel a little warm that he was providing these kids with a better life. He wondered if his mother had felt that way when she'd sent him to live with Monique, getting him out of the city and out of the gang life. The caravan made its way up the drive and into the parking garage. Tori parked next to Calvin, and they all got out, the four college kids staring around at the large space. This is a heck of a place, Harold breathed admiring the solid concrete. Jack stretched his arms above his head. Yeah, no complaints here. This is nothing, Calvin said with a grin, twirling his key ring around his finger. Just wait until you see your apartments. Harold turned to him, wide-eyed. Wait, apartments? He asked. As in plural? Yeah, we got a lot of space here, although you might have to pair off. One bedrooms are running low but we have plenty of two-bedroom units, Zion explained. Tori clapped her hands together. Yep, light years beyond the dorms, she gushed. Now before we go, Zion said, his voice serious. I want to make something clear to each of you. He straightened up, and the four kids stood at attention, staring at him. We're a community here, he continued. So we help each other out. 
Now, I'm not going to make anybody do anything they ain't comfortable with, so if you don't want to go out fighting and rounding up zombies, you don't have to. But you will have to carry your weight. Harold raised a hand. What other types of things can we do? He asked. Well, for starters, Calvin cut in. We could really use an upgraded defense system on the perimeter of the building. Given your, uh, unique skill sets, I'm sure you guys can come up with something. Harold and Jack immediately stepped away, inspecting one of the metal airways in the concrete to let fresh air into the garage. They could clearly see the wooded area through it on the other side. Yeah, we could certainly work with this, Harold said. Jack pointed to one of the metal posts. Yeah, lay some track down here. Rig up some metal spikes on wheels, Harold mused. Air compressor again, Jack added, rubbing his chin. Harold shook his head. I was thinking manual hydraulics. Jack snapped his fingers. One lever pull to deliver multiple strikes. That's what I'm thinking, Harold agreed. Zion held up his hands. Guys, you don't have to start drawing blueprints right now, he said, unable to contain a smile. There's plenty of time for that. And you'll be happy to know that we have a large number of stores to pull from, Calvin added as the boys returned. So whatever you need, there's a good chance we can get it. Zion nodded. In the meantime, though, let's go find you a place to call your own, he suggested. Figure we've killed enough of these fuckers today. The kids nodded, smiles all around, as they followed him to the stairs. They headed up to the first floor, where Cheryl stood in the lobby with a few older members of the community. Hey, Cheryl, Zion greeted, catching her attention as they entered. I'd like you to meet the new members of our little family. The blonde smiled. Pleasure to meet you all, she said. I'm sorry to cut our introductions short, but I've arranged for us all to have dinner together in an hour or so. Oh, thank you so much, Tori gushed. That would be lovely. Jack groaned excitedly. Finally, something other than ramen cooked on a camping stove. You've been in college how long? Harold teased. Shouldn't you be used to that by now? Cheryl laughed. Don't worry, it's something nicer than ramen, I promise, she assured them. In the meantime, if you want to follow my friends here, they'll take you to your new homes. She handed over two sets of keys to the men she'd been talking with. Apartments 313 and 314. They smiled warmly and led the four college kids off to get settled. As soon as they were gone, Zion turned to Cheryl. What's going on? He asked. Everything okay? Oh yeah, everything's great, she replied easily. I just figured being trapped in a car for hours with college kids would make you want a break. He chuckled, rubbing his forehead. You always look after me. That's why you hired me, she replied, flashing him a thousand-watt smile. Calvin held up a hand. I don't think we hired you, he corrected. If memory serves, you just showed up and started doing shit. Because even then I was looking out for you guys, she said, patting his shoulder. Speaking of looking out, Sion said, clearing his throat. How are the field reports looking? Cheryl nodded, back in work mode. Wendy's group was able to secure the survivors to the south. Both groups? Calvin asked. She shook her head. Just the one, she replied. There were no signs of the other one. They took a moment of somber quiet, and then Zion asked, what about the trainees? They were able to draw a few thousand of those things out of the city, Cheryl reported. They're on their last patrol of the day. Calvin nodded. Yeah, we passed them on the way in. They getting any better? Zion asked. Cheryl shrugged. Well, nobody died or was bitten, so I'd call it a win. Best you can hope for some days, he agreed. You boys get rested up, she said as she turned to leave. Dinner is at my place in an hour. Don't be late. Zion smiled. Wouldn't dream of it. As the stairwell door clicked shut, Calvin let out a deep breath. It never ceases to amaze me the shit we survive day in and day out. No shit, Zion agreed clapping him on the back. But at least we weren't hanging off the sides of parking decks or fighting through zombie walls in tunnels. Or worse, losing nipples in a badger fight. Calvin laughed. Thank God, my heart can only take so much. He reached up and palmed his nipples.
These things are sacred. They cracked up as they headed for the stairs. I haven't forgotten that you still owe me that story, Zion said. Calvin grinned. Figured I'd save it for dinner tonight, he declared. Make for some lively conversation. Zion shook his head, holding the door open. No time like the present to get the new kids properly introduced to us. End of book five. Up next, the action shifts to Mississippi as a military caravan travels the dangerous back roads of the state. <laughs>